John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, who, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed, his, washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you say, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Go to Galatians 5, verse 13, if you do them. Go to Galatians 5, verse 13 to 15. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Thanks, Glenn, for leading so well. And um, as Glenn pointed out, we are basing our Wednesday house groups on tonight's sermon. And there are questions on the church WhatsApp announcement group. If, you don't, if you're not part of that yet, come see me after. We'll get you onto the, the announcement group and into a house group as well where... We can encourage one another and discuss God's word and apply it more particularly to our own lives and situation. And we've been looking at on Sunday nights the one another statements of the Bible. There are about 50, I say 59 in all, but I personally didn't count them. So check it out, Google it, whatever. But there's about 59 one another statements. Some of them are the same, some of them overlap. Um, but we're looking tonight at serve one another. And we're jumping around scripture a little bit. So it would be helpful if you had your Bibles handy. Now, if I were to ask you a question this evening, um, who in this church or who are to be the givers of pastoral and physical care? Where would your mind immediately jump or who to whom would your mind immediately think about? Maybe you'd immediately think about the elders and deacons. They are the responsible ones in the church. Or some might even say, well, that's the pastor's job. But the 50 one another or 50 plus one another statements of scripture ask us not to start there. You know, maybe um, some things you'll have to go, go there at some point. 
But the one another statements ask us to start way back before we jump to other people to say, well, they are responsible for the care of others, and that's not me. At some point, we need to say, no, I am responsible. I'm the one that God has called to care for this other person, this friend in the church. And to consider that we're all in this together to work for our mutual strengthening and our mutual growth in Christ. Maybe you can put it this way. You know, if we ask the Bible some questions, let's ask the Bible some questions. Let's ask the Bible, um, who must admonish the rebelling believer? Who's responsible for loving the frustrating and serving the needy Christian in the church? Who must bear the burdens of the tired and the troubled church member? Who's responsible in this church for encouraging the despondent person in the chair in front of us this evening? Who's in charge? Who's responsible for that? And the Bible answers every one of those questions with one another are. Just keeps coming back to that same answer again and again. It's not that trained group of people over there that are responsible. It's me right here. We are all in this together. And this is a fundamental um, principle of a healthy church. A church that loves. A church that cares. A church that is there to uphold one another. Not to fight one another, not to push each other away, or not to get fed up with each other even, but to say, I'm in this for you. That's, what, that's why I came to church tonight. I'm going to look around so that I can one another someone else tonight. It's not Paul's job to one another. It's not the elders or the deacon's responsibility. It's my job to care, love bear the burdens, encourage, and even on the odd occasion to admonish others. On holidays this year, we went to um, Yorkshire Dales. Can't beat the Yorkshire Dales for holidays. And we went to this beautiful brownie cafe. If you're ever up in Yorkshire Dales, you've got to go to this brownie cafe. Delicious. You can see them making it. And it was opened. I noticed on the plaque outside, it was opened by the Brownlee Brothers. I don't know if you've heard of them but they were quite famous. They're less so now, but they um, were they're triathletes and they were always competing against each other. Alistair and Johnny Brownlee, they're still competing, but they became famous back in 2016, particularly when a dehydrated Johnny Brownlee, a Brownlee, not Brownie, I've got Brownies and Brownies mixed up. My mind's gone somewhere else completely. <laughs> Johnny Brownlee, he... He nearly collapsed. It was about a kilometer or so before the finish line of the World Triathlon Series in Mexico. And his brother, Alistair, was behind him. And he's about a kilometer from the end. And Alistair's about to run past him when Alistair stops. And they've, think about this, they've competed all their lives. They've, been, they've had this competitive spirit. I've got to beat my brother. Got me. Alistair gets to the side of Johnny. And instead of running past him, he gets his arm puts it over his shoulder, and he carries him virtually to the finish line. And Johnny's there staggering along, almost being dragged. And just as they get to the finish line, Alistair, who could have easily won the race, or beaten his brother anyway, he gets hold of his brother and he pushes him forward in front of him across the finish line. We can see church as a competition where... I must make it to the end and, well, just forget about my brothers and sisters with all their weaknesses and their annoying habits and so on. Or we can so serve one another that we all make it over the line together, maybe even pushing our our annoying brother or our weak sister. You go first. You're the winner. You get the prize before me. What kind of competitive spirit do we want in this church? Well, it's the competitive spirit that is one another. I'm here for them, not for me. It's this non-combatant spirit 
that really marks out a church that's mature and healthy. An immature and unhealthy church competes so that we alone, my, me, myself, I, win the prize, forget the others. And tonight's when another statement really bears this out. Serve one another. Serve one another. But why? Why? With all my own personal needs and all my own struggles, would I want to serve someone else? Well, because as we see, firstly, we were saved by a servant. We are saved by a servant. Um, Glenn read for us earlier from John chapter 13, where the Lord Jesus Christ, he takes off his outer garments, he puts on the clothes of a servant, and he goes and he washes his disciples' feet. And that would have been remarkable for anyone to do. Yet when we consider who this is, that is dressed as a servant with a bowl in hand and says, right, get your shoes off, I'm going to wash your feet. When we consider who this is, this is another level of astounding. If I saw you do that this evening, I'd be like, well, that is humble. What a godly person that is. But when we consider who this is, this is the Lord of glory. The one by whom all things were made and for whom all things exist. This was the anointed chosen Christ, the second person of the Trinity. This was the only hope for mankind, the one before whom all of creation will one day bow and say, he's Lord. This was the King of kings, the God of gods, whose glory filled the heavens and before whom all the righteous angels had for, for all of creation bowed before him and they covered their eyes and said, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God of hosts. This was the eternal, the righteous, the all-knowing and glorious Lord. And yet what was this man's constant refrain while on earth? This is what he kept saying. He's twice in Matthew alone. I've not come to be served, but to serve. And give my life as a ransom for many. The humility displayed in Christ is one of extremes. From a royal throne to washing the feet of a betrayer who will sell him out, and he knew it, and a denier of the faith. Let me wash your feet. I'm here to serve you. From the highest of heights to the depths of a grave, for those who hated him. From the worship of the angels to the mockery of a cross. From a kingly throne to a servant's robe. From the acceptance of heaven to the rejection of his own people. I have not come to be served. I've come to serve you. Everything marked him out not as a proud king demanding that all his subjects come and bow before me. Here I am on earth, the incarnated God of heaven, Emmanuel, God is with you, come and bow before me. No, the very opposite. He said, I demand that I bow before you and wash your feet. He gets down into the groveling dust of that house. He says, I bow before you. Let me clean you up. Let me wash you. This cannot possibly be put better than Philippians 2. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped after, but humbled himself, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Down and down and down comes the Lord of glory until he dies. He's buried in a tomb. Why? So that the deniers, the terrorists, the adulterers, the proud, the stubborn, the self-righteous, the gossips, the slanders, the liars, the malicious, 
the murderers, the foolish and the foolhardy could be forgiven and spend eternity with him. He's like, I am going to gather in some people for myself and I'm going to do it by serving them on the cross until they are lifted up to be in the place of royalty, to be the children of the living God, to be kings and priests themselves. I, the glorious one, will serve them, will humble myself so that they, the undeserving, might be lifted up to where I was. You know, the reason any of us have assurance of heaven tonight and can call God our Father is purely down to the fact that Christ served us to the ultimate of degrees, even the death of a cross, the humiliating death of a cross. He didn't just come and wash our dirty feet from the dust of the road, came and washed our souls clean from our filthy rebellion. We were rescued, not by a knight in shining armor like the old, uh, the old films, the, but by the despised and rejected man of sorrows, dressed in his cheap old clothes of a servant, he came to rescue and to save. What lengths did he go to serve us? There were no limits. He didn't say, I'm going to serve you to a degree, but hey, I've got my own limits. I'm not going beyond that. No. He comes down and down and down into the form of a human, well, into to being a real human being, down to be a servant, down to the cross, down to the grave. The story of the life of Christ is just one of down, down and down and down. There are no limits with him. He thought of you so much. He said, there's no limits to my serving you. I'll do everything it takes. Torturous cross, yep, I'll do that. Rejection by the world, I'll do that for you. Suffering, shame, and agony on the cross, yeah, I'll, I'll do that for you. Buried in the tomb, I've got this. I'll do this for you. I'm here to serve you. You were saved by a servant. Secondly, we've been saved to be a servant. We have been transformed. When we became a Christian, we have been remade into the image of Christ who saved us. And therefore, we will begin to reflect in our lives the new image of the Lord Jesus Christ in this time, in this place, in this city. In other words, we will become the servants. We read earlier from Galatians 5, Throughout Galatians, the Apostle Paul has been reminding this church of what the gospel actually is. They'd forgotten it all. And what they'd done as Galatian church, they had said, well, you can't just be saved by grace. You can't just be justified by grace alone. Because that means what you'll do is you say, well, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I can live now as I please. So the Galatians started to add layers to the gospel. So said, you can't just be saved by grace, you need to keep the Mosaic law. And the rites and the ceremonies of the law. And you've got to do X and the Y and Z. And if you tick all these check boxes, then the Lord will accept you. And you won't live in this freedom that allows you to do as you like. Their argument was that if salvation was purely by grace, then that would set Christians at liberty to do as they please. And obviously, they doing as they please would mean they would sin. You need rules to keep you in check. Paul says, no, you don't. Rules, external laws, limit our freedom to a certain point and keep us in check to a certain point. But the gospel gives a better way. The gospel means that you're filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit means that you now bear fruits in keeping with the character of God. It's not like, oh, I better check that one. I haven't done that one today. I'm okay. God must really love me today because I'm saved by grace and ticking the boxes. No, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
the Spirit works out of us who have been saved by grace alone such character that reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. And so being saved by grace alone doesn't mean that we live as we please because we, well, we do live as we please, but we have a new nature that desires to reflect Christ. And so living as we please for a Christian means I want to be as godly as I possibly can. I want to be like Christ as much as I can. It's only the sinful nature that says, I want to live as I please, I'll, I'll sin. And, and that's a non-Christian living as you please. But a Christian filled with the Spirit overflows with these new fruits and just abounds and flourishes. And so Paul says at the end of Galatians 5 that you don't need these rules and checks and balances. You need the Spirit. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You're called to be free. You don't need these limits that these Galatian believers are putting on you to say you're only acceptable to God if you keep these rules. No, you were called to be free. But, he says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. In other words, Paul is saying in Galatians, you are saved to serve not sin. It's really the summary of what he's saying. Because there's a direct line between faith and salvation from sin and saved by grace alone. There's a direct line from there to becoming a servant of the people of God and to serve one another for the rest of our lives. One leads naturally to the other. Grace leads to servanting. And so it's vitally important for healthy service to know that we don't do this in our own power, but by the power of the Spirit. And we don't serve one another in order to keep the checklist and say, God, I, I did do the service bit today. It must be more pleasing to you today than I was yesterday. We do it by the power of the Spirit from the basis of having already been fully accepted in Jesus Christ. Serving is the overflow of grace in a transformed heart. And Philippians 2 is really helpful in this. It tells us what our salvation brings in terms of a change of attitude. Philippians 2 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, humbled himself. Have that mind, the mind of Christ. Christ is the exemplar pattern of humble serving one another. And we have been empowered by the Spirit to reflect Him in this. We don't do this in our own power. We have been saved by a servant to be servants. And then thirdly, we have all been gifted to serve. Let me say that again. We have all been gifted to serve. You know, most of us look at ourselves and we might say to ourselves often, what have I got to offer? What, me? What, what can I give? How can I help others in any sort of meaningful way? We often feel out of our depth, lacking wisdom, lacking ability, lacking direction on how do I serve others within the church in any sort of beneficial way to them. And here 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 10 and 11 give us a helpful reminder that if you're a Christian, you do have all the resources and all the gifting required to fulfill what Christ has commanded. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says this, 
As each has, get, has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, this is what we say to ourselves. Who am I? What kind of, I, I can't do this. I can't serve others in any sort of meaningful way. And that weakness has been deliberately built into us by God. Why? Because what happens if we are strong enough and wise enough and have the abilities within ourselves to do all the serving and helping others that is necessary? What we'll do is we'll serve someone and say, see what I did there? <laughs> like, come on, deserve a bit of praise for this. Look who I am. Look what I've done. Look how successful I've been. But he says, no, I have built in weakness so that when you serve others and it, it, there's a measure of success, all the glory and all the praise goes to the God who gave you the wisdom in that moment and the strength and character in that moment. So we ought not to be surprised to consider ourselves too weak to serve one another. Lacking the internal ability to maintain a healthy servant attitude. It's built in. But also, God has gifted us. Given us abilities and skill sets that others within the church don't have, but you have, and Doing it, he puts us each in, our, in the church here to have the abilities, have the gifts, so that together we might serve others. Here the promise is that he will strengthen us for long-term servanting. He has gifted us with the resources that are required to live in this way. The fact that you are here tonight, if you're a Christian, you hear in the church, it means that the risen Christ personally gifted you with varied gifts, with the purpose of serving someone else in this church. Every person with needs is different. Every person with gifts is different. So you might be able to help someone that someone else would have no ability or gifting to do. And this is where the one anothering becomes a real inherent part of a healthy church, where we know when to serve and we know when to delegate serving. When we say, that person is ideal for that person, I'm going to go and say, do you mind helping them? Do you mind being helped by them? When we know I can take this on, by God's strength and grace, I'll take this on, I'll help them, I'll serve them, I'll I can meet their needs in some way. And in other times we say, well, let's draw others in. Maybe together, maybe three of us can help this person. Maybe four, maybe that person over there. We serve one another. Not I serve them, but together we work on this so that each one of us is helped with our particular needs. Each of us has been gifted to serve. But then two brief final points. How do we serve? And how do we serve without burning out? Well, to serve others begins with humility. That's, it's got to start there. To genuinely consider, as Paul says in Philippians, to con genuinely consider others as better than ourselves. None of us like to do this. We always look at someone else and say, well, I would never have fallen for that. I'll never be a person who needs that. And so we consider ourselves better than others. But if we have this humility that says, well, I could, I could fall for this anytime. I could need this at any time. I, I look at them and I genuinely think, God, is, God treats them a special, unique person. Even if they have loads of needs, they are particularly designed by Christ, carefully loved by him, served by him at the cross. I consider them better than myself. So we purposely lower ourselves if necessary until we are bowing at the needy person's feet 
acknowledging that they are better than us. And then we wash their feet when we're down there. To serve others begins with humility. To serve others means to intentionally be on the lookout for those in need. And to ask ourselves, can I do anything to help? Because if God has shown me a need, then maybe he's shown me for a reason. And it's so that I can help. And that might be directly helping or it might be delegating, as I said. But we ask ourselves, how can I get involved in this? How can I encourage them, bless them, lift them up so that they make it to the end? To serve is to deliberately commit ourselves and our resources and our gifts to meeting the needs of others. God has given us all so much. Might have given us money or time or energy or experiences or unique giftings or certain trials that we've been through that are more relevant to someone else. He's given us so much different energies and expertises even if that's a word, but he's given us different things in order that we might use what he has given us in the past to help others in the present and into the future. And I think that's why it's called Serve One Another, because this is a whole church involvement in serving an individual. God's given us very unique giftings and experiences to meet the unique giftings and challenges within other people. We serve intentionally, humbly, and deliberately. But how do we serve without burning out? Because that's a big question, isn't it? Many of you will know times that you've so served someone that it's utterly drained you to the point where you go, I need someone to serve me. I'm completely exhausted. I'm utterly burnt out. I can't do anymore. I need someone to come and serve me. And there are many answers, of course, and we can consider some of them on the house groups on Wednesday. But consider, first of all, Christ. Consider Christ. The one who continually found his strength from deliberately leaving those he was serving, as we heard this morning, to intentionally go to the mountains of Galilee, to go and meet with the Father, to separate himself from those with great needs. He kept saying, there's sheep without a shepherd. I could be here 24-7, but I'm going to withdraw because I need to spend time with my Father. I need resources. I need refreshing. I need to take a break from this and spend time with God in order to get renewed in strength so that I can go back across the lake to the thousands of people that are waiting for me. Sometimes the crowds followed him. <laughs> and they're like, Lord, we need your help. And he didn't say, well, I'm on a rest. I'm on a break here. He said, well, let, let, me, let me encourage you. Let me tell you a parable. Let me tell you about the kingdom. Sometimes they came across and they traveled so far to meet him that they had no food. And so he went to extraordinary lengths to provide food for the needy, to serve them. But he always made sure that he spent nights in prayer, days apart, times in the wilderness when it was just him and God, refreshing himself, making sure that he wasn't so exhausted that he couldn't adequately serve the people that he was sent to serve. The Gospels often say, that he didn't do certain things for his hour had not yet come. And what that means is referring to the cross, where on the cross he would give everything. So when he keeps saying, my hour has not yet come, he's saying, I'm not going to give everything at this moment. That's for another hour. I'm not going to die in this situation. I'm going to die in the, in the future. So I'm not going to give everything, every part of my flesh and life and I'm going to give resources, I'm going to help, I'm going to serve. But it's a future hour when I'm going to serve in, a, in an utter way. And that's the kind of wisdom that we need in order to not burn out. It's like, how much energy, how many resources do I put into this? And sometimes we have to, like Christ, say, 
I can't give everything. I can give something, but I can't give everything. That's for another time. We have to be wise and never feel guilty for saying to someone in need, I can't do this. But I can point you to someone who can. And I'll pray, I'll pray for you, but let me take you to someone with better resources than I have right now. Don't feel guilty for that, for Christ did it. And he never sinned. Instead, we trust that the Father will care for his people. He will hold them securely in his hand. He'll never leave them. He'll never forsake them. I remember the pastor telling me that he really regrets that day when a lady came to him very in need and people had let her down. And he said to her, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You can trust me. He said, I regret that because then a situation came up where he couldn't be there to care and provide. It was impossible. There is only one who can truly say, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake, I'll never let you down. And that's not us. It's the Father in heaven. So we point people away to him and say, I may fail you in some way in the future, but I know one who never will. You trust him. You look to him. He will provide even when I can't. We are saved to serve, but we're not saved to sink. We are saved by the Savior, servant of all, and we are not the, sa the Savior of all. Sometimes when we burn out, it's because we are committing idolatry even as we're serving and saying, I'm the God of the situation. I can save them. I can do this. It's within me. It's in my grasp. No, it's idolatry, friends, even the servanting. We point people to the Savior and say, I'll help. I'll serve. I'll do what I can. I'll point you in the right direction. But ultimately, there is only one Savior of all, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so with grace and with humility and with wisdom, let's serve one another. Let's serve one another and reflect Christ well in the humble and gentle attitudes that we have to one another so that we all make it to the end together. And in that final moment when you could be glorified for your servanting, you push the other person along the line, across the line, see, you won. Because I consider you better than myself. Let's pray.